Like, oh, it's it's an old label or an old uh, sign or something. No smoking. Well, no smoking. Uh -oh. Breaking that rule. Yeah, uh, <laughs> bad news for you. Yeah. <laughs> Hi guys, welcome to Mad Scientist Barbecue. I'm Jeremy Yoder and today I am so excited to be at Fat Stack Smokers where they're going to be building me a custom smoker. I've talked to my friend Eric who's one of the co-owners here and he's going to show us a little bit of what he does. We're going to see a little bit of plasma cutting, welding, grinding, and then we're going to talk about some real serious barbecue. We're going to talk making smokers and if those are things that interest you, this is the video you need to watch. This is Eric, co-owner of Fat Stack Smokers. Here he's seasoning up a rack of ribs to put on the cooker while I spend some time at the shop making the machines that produce delicious, beautiful, smoky barbecue goodness. He showed us around his shop and even took time to answer some of my questions. The first question I've got is, how would you describe the business you have here at Fat Stack Smokers? Well, Fast Stack Smokers was the product of a combination of two things, really. My love for welding and metal fabrication, and my love for barbecue. I decided to bring both of those together, and I was fortunate enough to be able to do so in the form of a company that builds smokers, everything from little consumer-sized backyard smokers designed for your average weekend barbecue all the way up to 1,000-gallon uh, monsters. like that. Yeah, yeah, that sit on trailers and uh, operate catering businesses and so forth. I think that's really exciting for people who are into barbecue to see how their smokers are made. It's not just you place an order online and you just get this smoker that arrives on a pallet. You get to see, oh, this is how it actually gets put together. And it's also, I think, really important to know that the person who's building your smoker understands concepts that are related to the actual barbecue process. Like, am I going to have enough airflow? How is this going to maintain the temperature? what kind of smoke quality is this going to produce? Whereas maybe if you were just an engineer, you might be thinking, oh, well, how do I get the smoke, uh, how do I get the temperature, rather, as even as possible across the grates, but they might have something that doesn't draw well and produces really dirty smoke. So somebody who understands both aspects from like fabrication to actually smoking the meat is an immense benefit for anybody who wants to buy a smoker. So I think that's something that is very undervalued when many people are buying smokers. In terms of, uh, the smokers you make, what are the what are the levels of, of custom sizes that you do? Uh, well, we have two consumer sort of backyard size smokers, a 90 gallon and a 110 gallon. Both of those uh, come in the shape of an octagon, uh, much like this guy right here okay. that we're cooking on today. Cool. Uh, and those are reverse flow. Now, above that size, I also make everything from uh, 172 gallon uh, all the way up to a 1,000 gallon propane tank smoker. And those can be mounted on other casters, so if you want to wheel them around your patio, if, if you choose to do so, or they can be trailer mounted if you need to be mobile to go to catering events and so forth. So this is one of your current backyard models that you sell here. So, so tell us about this. I know it's in the shape of an octagon. Yep. Um, is there a reason for that, or did it just happen to come out that way and you liked it? So originally, the octagon shape stemmed from a design uh, issue. I had just never seen an octagonal smoker. I really liked the kind of the, the angular lines of it. I designed it out and really dug the way it looked. I had no idea I was gonna be building something that cooked as well as this does. Uh, I couldn't tell you why the, oct the octagon shape makes this thing manage the smoke and gas the way it does, but this cooks as, as well as, if not better, than any smoker I've ever used. So uh, this is our 90 gallon smoker. It's a 36 inch long cook chamber, and it's reverse flow, so it's got a baffle welded in along the bottom, uh, and the gas gets pushed around the baffle, and you can see the, the chimney stack here comes out on the same side at about great height. So the grates are about halfway uh, up in the cook chamber to kind of give you uh, as even of a temperature as you can across the cooking surface. Right, and you don't lose any space because it's reverse flow. Right, so even this guy, a 36 inch long cook chamber, I mean, with the upper rack installed, you can do four briskets, a couple racks of spares, and some beef ribs up top, no problem. Wow. Um, so that's a that's a lot of real estate. You can probably feed 30, 40 people off of something that is not a lot bigger than what you find out in front of your average home improvement store. Right, so for a small footprint, you get a lot of cooking space. Right, and actually, that, act, that played into the design as a Los Angelino, a lot of us have the situation where you just don't have all that much space. A lot of places in this country, uh, you have a big backyard, a big side yard, you can throw as big of a smoker back there as you want. My challenge has always been, for all of my hobbies, like how do I fit this 
space intensive hobby into a very space limited environment that is, you know, uh, the sort of more packed areas of Los Angeles. And so for me, this was all about how do I get the most barbecue out of the smallest space, and that's really where this comes from. So I've got one rack of spare ribs on at the moment, just getting going. And you can see that this rack pulls out so you can access whatever you're cooking. Baffle runs along the bottom there and the drain uh, to drain out all the grease runs along the side. Yeah, so one thing I noticed about this smoker that I really, really appreciate is this big drain, okay? In my smoker, one of the downsides is that it's got a small drain and not everything wants to drain out of there. Now, if you got you know a chunk of fat or a chunk of meat that tears off while you're moving meat on the grate or you're putting meat on or taking meat off, um, it can clog it up and that ruins the cook because you have to stop and you know fix that so you don't get a grease fire. One thing I really appreciate about this smoker is it's got a big fat drain. You know, it's got a fat stack but a fat drain here and um, that's gonna be huge for anybody who's um, cooking a large quantity of meat, which this can do. So why don't you tell us about the first smoker you ever built? How did that process come together? How did you decide? I mean, cause I've thought about building a smoker before and, and honestly I was thinking, man, I'll go find some propane tank in the middle of the woods somewhere and I'll like have a huge truck with a winch and I'll pull it out of there and go turn it into the greatest smoker ever. But I realized I have no idea how to do any of that. I can't weld, I, I don't know how to use any of the equipment. I have no place to do it. But for you, how did you get to the place where you decided, okay, I'm gonna build my own smoker and this is how I'm gonna do it? Well, it actually started first with welding. A few years ago, I was working as an accountant in an office, cubicle, your average workaday uh, American Joe, and I decided that I, on a lark that I wanted to learn how to weld uh, for another hobby of mine, which is off-roading and building oh, cool. up Jeeps. Yeah. And I learned how to weld and I fell in love with it immediately. Decided that's what I was going to do from now on. Learned everything I could about the process. Spent all of my time in a metal shop welding uh, wherever I could. My very first project was a set of Jeep fenders, so I stayed true to that mission. But my very next project was a barbecue. And that was sort of accidental. I just I realized that I, I had been barbecuing for a long time, but I never really had a decent smoker. After that project, I still didn't have a decent smoker, but I had made something. Uh, and that, that was, that was the, the, the important part, was really starting it off. I started off with a, a 55 gallon drum, like a lot of people do, cut it up, welded it together, uh, and made it into something that could be used to barbecue meats. From there, things just kind of progressed naturally. The co-founder of this business, Steve, was actually a student of mine at a, a metal shop where I was teaching, and he came in and told me, you know, as part of a class he was taking, hey, I want to learn how to build a, or I want to build a smoker. And what do most people want to build? Most people build, you know, coffee tables, chairs, okay. benches, nice stuff, you know. Um, right. But when they, when when he walked in, it was like, hey, I want to build an offset smoker. Do you know what that is? And I was like, we're gonna have to talk. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we. And he spent, you know, he spent a, a weeks uh, building a beautiful little box-shaped smoker. Uh, that you can actually see it on my Instagram. It's, it's on there now. Um, and then from there, you know, I think probably over a beer one night, we were like, hey, you know, this is we both love this so much. And he's like, I've got this space up in Sun Valley with these propane tanks in it. And uh, it just, you know, from there, it was, everything just kind of, the ball just started rolling. We started building, uh, our, first our first tank smoker was a 500 gallon. It's currently being used by a guy who runs uh, Moose Craft Barbecue on, uh, on Instagram. And then from there, we've just been in contact with all, all various, you know, people around LA who are doing pop-ups and catering and restaurants. And it just sort of developed kind of organically from, a 55 gallon drum all the way up to a thousand gallon trailer smoker. Nice. Yeah. That's exciting. This is the first smoker you ever built. Do you use this thing anymore? You know, I haven't used it in a while, but I can't bring myself to get rid of it. It's sentimental at this point. Uh, this was the first one I ever built. Right. Actually, it started off as not even a smoker, but just a barrel uh, cooker. So I, this firebox wasn't here when I first built it. Originally, it just had a stack and I would build fires off the one side and have meat on the other. This thing kind of grew over the years as the scrap pile would allow. I found some metal for the firebox, attached it, it became an offset. Um, and it always will have a special place in my heart. I won't be able to get rid of it, but uh, I don't do a whole lot of cooking on it anymore. As you can see, the, the handle is broken off right. and it's, uh, it's seen better days for sure. What was the first smoker you used to actually smoke meat? What, or how did you get into barbecue in general? A lot of people, you know, they, they like for me, the first thing I ever had was a, like a $40 cheap, like one of those square grills yeah. that you can get at, yeah. at like Kroger, yeah. which, which is Ralph's here. I got it at Kroger. And I thought I was the man, grilling chicken, put butter on it, 
and I thought I thought I had it all figured out. Like this yeah. is this is the pinnacle of success in terms of fire and meat. Uh, and I later came to realize I was wrong. But that's how I got started with it, and it was kind of bitten by the the bug. You know, you get that kind of visceral sure. reaction to fire plus meat equals good. Me man, me make food. <laughs> but um, that's how I got into it initially. And my first smoker was, I didn't even know what smoking meat was, but there was a, a sale at Orchard Supply Hardware and they said, we'll pay the sales tax for you. And I thought, oh, that's a deal. <laughs> so I went to Orchard Supply Hardware. I walked in and I saw this thing and I thought it was the Rolls Royce of grilling and barbecue because it had a propane side, it was about this big. It had a charcoal side and it had a tiny little paper thin firebox below it. And I thought, oh man, what can't you do with this thing? This is, this is the very best you could yeah. ever get. So I got it and I, I strapped it on top of a friend's truck and we drove it home, went like five miles an hour. I got it out and I was so excited. And the first thing I made was smoked pizza. Horrible idea. Sure. Yeah. But you know, you gotta learn. That thing basically rusted through in about a year of using it and I realized I had to get something better. Now for you, what was that process like from I'm guessing it was maybe first barbecue or grilling burgers. Like, what did that, what did that go for? So it started for me when I was growing up. I'm from Michigan originally, and my dad was one of these classic Midwestern people who really thought that he was a barbecue expert. Uh, and he really, he made, not to disparage any, anyone, but he made uh, just terrible barbecue. It, it was not good, but he was really into it, man. I mean, you know, and for, for me, just the, the Saturday nights when my family, would, we'd all gather on the back porch and sit down and eat these um, overcooked, burnt uh, pieces of meat. Uh, that was just one of the most special memories I have from my childhood. And yeah. even, if the, even if the barbecue wasn't good, but the fact that it w there was barbecue was good. And so the first time I ever actually lit my own barbecue was in college. Uh, my roommate and I put together all of our resources and split the cost of a $70 propane grill from big box hardware store and I proceeded to start you know messing around with it right away I bought a little rotisserie for it and I, the, I think the first thing I did was uh, ribs that I cooked on a rotisserie which didn't work out so well because I took a nap and fell asleep and woke <laughs> up and it was I opened the thing and it was just carbon and bones rotating on the spit just totally burnt to a crisp um, but I was hooked and, you know I mean it was the the, the act of barbecuing and, and producing this product was something that, that I was like couldn't get enough of and, and over the years I've, I've cooked on a lot of different sort of sub suboptimal uh, cooking rigs and I've you know never really had a proper smoker I didn't kind of even know what a proper smoker was for a long time um, I knew there was such a thing as Texas barbecue but I was you know didn't really know much about it until probably about um, you know four or five years ago when I built the, the barrel smoker uh, and that was really what when I started getting into it and really geeking out on like the all the specifics of you know what makes indirect heat do what it does why is smoke important i like a lot of people who are new to barbecue thought hey more smoke means more flavor right so you throw as many wood chips on that charcoal as you can oh exactly man. you know i shudder to even mention that but uh you know it's if it, 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 you, you don't you don't know you don't know and uh it, you know you got to kind of experiment and play and that's a lot of it it was just it was such a fun i mean you know obviously there's fire involved so that's great you get to burn stuff and then there's meat and like you said it's a whole you know and then at the end of the day your friends, your family come over, and even if it's bad barbecue, I found most people really do love it, and they have a good time. And, I, and just like sitting around that table when I was a kid, even if the barbecue's not great, the fact that there is barbecue is great. So right. uh, from there, when I learned how to make really good barbecue, now it's now the, my new sort of um, philosophy is like I want to get as many people as around me as possible. I want to give this knowledge to them so they can then take this and can fall in love with the, the hobby and and make really great ribs, turkey, chicken, brisket for their friends and family and kind of just spread the spread the joy, you know? Right, yeah. Even when I was first getting started and I was ruining everything, I enjoyed the heck out of it. It was great. Yeah. I was ruining yeah. meat left and right and I did the same thing. I thought, well, smoke is good, more smoke is better, right? And so I completely understand that too. I was ruining meat and eating it anyway. I had, I had no idea what I was doing. But doing it enough, I started to realize, yeah, you know, I think there's a better way. And so experimenting, figuring out what works, what makes good barbecue, what doesn't. It was just a, a process where you kind of hone your skills so that eventually you can produce really good barbecue. Now, what would you say is the biggest difference between a quality smoker uh, or and a, maybe a lower quality cheap smoker that most people have? I think, I think in my mind, 
I have an idea of what most people use to smoke meat, and then I think of what most people should use to smoke meat as two separate categories. So to you, what's the biggest difference there? For me, there are two things that make a really good smoker a really good smoker. The first is the ability to use an all wood fire. You just can't get the right kind of barbecue, in my opinion, out of a, out of a charcoal fire as you can out of something that's burning properly seasoned and properly split hardwood. Yeah, so, I agree. I think uh, real barbecue requires a real fire. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So that's the first thing. And the second thing, the second aspect of a really good smoker sort of is a corollary to the first, which is you need build quality and materials that are able to handle running a live fire and provide the kind of thermal dynamics necessary to sort of keep the environment that's in, in which you're cooking the meat the right temperature, the right humidity, with the right airflow. And so, you know, a lot of these, like you'll see smokers that are advertised as, as stick burners, wood, wood uh, barbecues, and they're selling them for a few hundred bucks outside the hardware store. And the difference really is, if you look at them, they're all made out of very, very thin sheet metal. You know, they're paper thin. And the biggest problem there is that if you're running a uh, five or 600 degree fire next to a piece of sheet metal, that sheet metal is just gonna transfer the heat right through the wall and you're not really getting an indirect heat. You can mess with it, play with it. I've seen people out there, you know, welding stuff onto their cheap smokers and trying to modify them. But really what makes a good smoker a good smoker has a lot to do with the thickness of the material involved. Our smokers are all made out of quarter inch thick steel, for example. We found that quarter inch is kind of the magic number between keeping the weight down and also uh, having you know, a, a resistance to, to sort of movement in temperature. Right. Um, they radiate heat slowly enough that they can sort of contain the fire and just keep the hot gas and smoke flowing over the barbecue, which is really what keeps the temperatures inside the cook chamber nice and even. And also makes your job as a barbecue chef a little bit easier because you don't have to add fuel as often when the temperature doesn't move as, as, as drastically. It's only moving a few degrees over the course of an hour. It makes the job of managing the fire a little bit easier. So I would say materials of build quality and then the ability to run an all-wood fire are the most important things to me in a, in a smoker. Yeah, that, that, I think that makes complete sense. I noticed that when I uh, had my first smoker made out of the thin sheet metal, when I put a chunk of wood, I was just using wood chunks, not even little splits, but using wood chunks. What I'd notice is the temperature would be down at like 200. I'd put a chunk on. It would go to like 330, and I'd have these wild fluctuations just because the fire was so close to the cooking surface itself that I'd get lots of radiant heat that I didn't want. And beyond that, the other issue was that in order to produce real combustion, so for the wood to burst into flame to produce a better quality of barbecue, what happened is the, the temperature would spike, come back down, and for only a short window would I get the kind of smoke that I really wanted. So it would smolder or it would just be catching fire and the whole process produced a, a lesser quality barbecue. It produced inferior barbecue to what you produce on good equipment that has good thermodynamics and can produce the quality of smoke that's required for great barbecue. All right, so I have to know briskets, is it butcher paper or is it aluminum foil? I mean, you can't even ask that question. <laughs> What are, what are we doing here? It's butcher paper. It's fighting words, man. Oh, man. Yeah, Texas style, right? I've done it both ways. The butcher paper, for me, be, the breathability of it uh, keeps the bark crispy. And there's nothing more depressing than spending eight to ten hours cooking a brisket and then being able to wipe the bark off with your finger. Um, right. That's not bark. That's mush. And, right. Uh, I found that aluminum foil just gets, it, it just softens, it kind of braises it almost a little bit and the steam in there. And it just, it just I don't know, for, for my money, uh, butcher paper every time. For me, I got started with aluminum foil, and I actually just recently started doing cooks with butcher paper. And I think you're right, I think butcher paper produces a better quality product in the end. But for me, I started actual barbecuing because I was watching like barbecue pit masters on YouTube and on, on TV, and I would see all these people and they were doing all kinds of crazy stuff like injecting their meat and you know they make ribs and it's got butter and agave and a million ingredients that go into it. And yeah, and it's, it's almost like they're, they're making a witch's brew of stuff that's going to make magic yeah. in their barbecue. And really the magic is happening right here in the firebox. Yes. And so that's how I started imitating people because I think that a lot of people, the best way to learn is kind of through imitation. You see somebody who's great at doing something, you see somebody who's got a great jump shot, you want to try and imitate that. And so for me, I was trying to imitate that. And what I didn't realize at the time was that competition barbecue and barbecue that people want to eat on a daily or weekly basis are two different things. 
because you don't want you know a sticky sweet rib if you're planning to eat a half a rack of ribs if you're taking one right. bite that's one thing right and so because of that i saw everybody using aluminum foil for everything so i thought oh i have to use aluminum foil it produces the best quality product and what i didn't realize at the time was the issue of breathability and bark formation and bark preservation that you get with butcher paper now with aluminum foil i think that's not necessarily a bad way for somebody to start because it's kind of safer you're less likely to i think burn the meat but ultimately i think if if you're if your biggest goal is to produce the best barbecue you can, I think butcher paper is the best way to go. So you said you do both standard flow and reverse flow. Uh, what I've noticed is a lot of manufacturers only do one. Like they'll only do standard flow. Like uh, I was looking at Yoder smokers, and if I'm not mistaken, I think they exclusively use standard flow smokers. I think that's right. Um, and then there are companies like Lang where they only do reverse flow. So you said you do both. What are the benefits of each and, and why do you make both? Well, we make both standard flow and reverse flow because I think that they're two different tools that have their own distinct advantages and disadvantages. Uh, and depending on what you're doing, one is always gonna be more suitable than the other. Now, for example, if you are a backyard chef and you don't have as much space to run a 250 or a 500 gallon smoker and you just need as much real estate as you can get inside of uh, a smoker, Reverse flow really is the way to go, and that is the chief advantage of reverse flow for my money, uh, is the ability to use the entire surface inside the cook chamber. A standard flow smoker, because you're going to have the firebox at one end and the chimney at the other end, you're going to have a spot where the firebox lets out all of that hot gas and smoke into the cook chamber that no matter what you do is going to be too hot to cook on. Now there's all kinds of ways that people deal with that from water pan, so using a piece of wood there, um, but the bottom line is you're still gonna lose some real estate where you could put a rack of ribs or some chicken or maybe part of a brisket if you were doing several briskets. So for a smaller smoker, uh, economy of space really demands reverse flow in my opinion. That coupled with the reverse flow's ability to sort of more evenly control temperature from one side of the cook chamber to the other, I think just makes it a perfect smoker for, for smaller cooks. I personally do all of my barbecue on reverse flow. I love it. And I will build a reverse flow anything up to about 500 gallons. For anything 500 gallons and larger, you start to lose the benefit of being able to control the temperature from one end of the cook chamber to the other. And you start not really needing that benefit when you start thinking about having a, you know, a 10, 12, 14, 18 foot long cook surface, losing one or two feet at one end really isn't that big of a deal because you've got the extra real estate. And it's about, for something that big, would you say standard flow is kind of necessary to produce enough air flow? To, yeah, to, to move the air in my the experience, part? when you get bigger than 500 gallons, it's, it, it starts to get very difficult to tune the placement of like the baffle and the stack, for example, to get the gas and smoke to flow properly around and back out without leaving cold spots inside the chamber. That's sort of the Achilles heel of the reverse flow. So for us, making a reverse flow and a standard flow is important because we understand that at, at different sizes and for different people's needs, one may work better than the other. It is more difficult to do it that way, and I think the reason a lot of people only manufacture one or the other is that, you know, there's there's something to be said for getting really good at doing one thing, right? right. Um, since I'm sort of first and foremost a barbecue enthusiast, and since that's kind of Fat Stack's whole position is that we, we really want to make sure that the barbecue that's coming off of our smokers is the best that it can possibly be, I'm more interested in, in how to make the best of each type of smoker. So that we can offer that and, and make sure that, you know, if you're a rever reverse flow person, we've got a reverse flow smoker. If you're a standard flow person, we've got a standard flow smoker. There's no one size fits all solution uh, when it comes to this kind of equipment. Right. And so. To that end, I know you do a lot of uh, customizations just for each customer who wants, oh, I want my uh, firebox door handle to be a meat cleaver and sure. things like that. So what kinds of things have you done for customers in the past? Like how have you customized it to make it not just, oh, I got a smoker from this manufacturer. It's like, no, no, this is my smoker. You built it for me. Well, that goes back for, for us to the concept that, you know, when, if you're buying a smoker of that size and you're going to be using it that much, it really is an expression of who you are and what you're doing. And so it's, I don't really want my, every smoker that I make to look the same. I want your smoker to reflect your business or your personality or your passions. So for example, this smoker here is going to get a lot of retro touches. The, this is a, a, an actual uh, vintage meat cleaver that's being used for the handle. And we're going to have vintage white wall tires with uh, chrome hubcap wheels on the trailer. I mean, it's a awesome. very, very sort of old school retro because that's 
the client. That's he want. That's his style. He wants. He wants it retro. Um, I've done everything from like a, a Mad Max apocalypse themed smoker. Uh, you can see a, a discarded um, prop that was didn't quite make the cut for that smoker. But there, here's an example of right. something that. Uh, now we just use this to scare the UPS guy. But um, <laughs> custom custom handles, things that sort of have give little signature touches and right. sort of uh, showcase the personality of the smoker and the personality of the people who are going to be ultimately using it. Because that's the thing. Each for me, each one of these tanks, they're all different. They're all kind of the same size or roughly the same size, but each one's going to have its own character, its own personality. So why not, if you can do it, accentuate that personality, accentuate that character with the little details, the little custom touches that really make it a fat sack smoker and something that people can not just really like to cook on, but like to look at and be around. Right. And I think that's something unique that you do here that you couldn't get from lots of other places. So what, what are some of the other things that you think make fat sack smokers a unique place to get your smoker if you're if you're serious about barbecue and you want to get something that's really high quality why come to fat stack smokers rather than any of these other places well really for us it's it comes down to spreading good barbecue great barbecue throughout california southern california los angeles when we first started this company uh, we realized that there just aren't many people out there doing it and and th those that we did find they didn't seem to be first and foremost like barbecue enthusiasts. They were really first and foremost manufacturers, fabricators, right. and right. so forth. And so, for example, our smokers, when the, each and every one, when it gets finished, it doesn't leave the shop until it not just has been seasoned, which everyone, you know, if you buy a smoker like this, you expect it to come with the, the inside seasoned with fire and oil. But we don't just season ours, we actually do a test book on ours. Um, we right. won't let a smoker out of our shop until, we, until it has demonstrated the ability to cook the way that I expect it to cook. Right. And if it's not there, uh, we'll haul it right back in and cut things off and weld new things on and fix that problem because it's it's not about you know just selling a bunch of smokers and making sure our names out there. The the most important thing for me personally is that fat stack smokers are recognized as cookers that can cook excellent barbecue that can make the kind of barbecue that surprise people. Uh, there's there's a great experience that I love to to share and it's when someone's never had a proper brisket. You know, right. and they think they know what barbecue is, but they've never really, they've never had that taste. And they had to take that first bite of that, that brisket and the look on their face, that kind of, it's almost like surprise, like what did you just do to me look on their face? <laughs> uh, and it's changed, it, everything changes. From there, it's like, now, now you know, now you've seen right. what these things can do, go out and do it yourself. Go out and get yourself a smoker and start playing around and perfecting the craft and getting into it. Um, that's just fun. I mean, that, and, and so, so for, for us, uh, fat sack smokers really, the, the key is, is is spreading that kind of barbecue and, and uh, passion for barbecue as far and wide as we can. Right. And I think that that shows first and foremost integrity and, and integrity in the sense of every part of your business is touching every other part. So the quality of the manufacturing that you have matches what people expect when they have a final product that's going to be cooking the barbecue. So it's it's all coming together with somebody who understands both sides of the business and you're being honest and upfront with the customer and the the level of quality control that you can have here because each job is a custom job and because you know everything that goes into producing good barbecue and you take the, the smokers on a test cook yourself just to make sure that everything's perfect I think that's something that you can't find anywhere else at least not that I'm aware of and so that's why I think your business is, is set apart and for anybody who's interested in getting a smoker, if you're serious about barbecue, I think that's why Fat Stack is the place. And then one last question, how did you get the name Fat Stack Smokers? Where did it come from? It actually came from our first barbecue that we made, the 500 gallon that's uh -huh. being used by, uh, by Moose out in East LA. We were pouring over materials options for our, for our stack, and we realized that you know a six inch pipe is what most people who make a 500 gallon smoker use. And we were looking at it and it just didn't look right, it didn't feel right, it was a very heavy material and we wanted a bigger diameter. So I went, I, I called all over Southern California, I found a, a local business out in Azusa that sells ridiculous sized tubes and we got some 8 inch steel tube. Um, which when we got it and we they unloaded it off the truck, we took one look at this thing and it was just like, what I mean, it, that's a fat stack, you know. Right. <laughs> so, so there it is, fat yeah. stack smokers, and Great. Um, all of our all of our catering sizes, 500 gallons and above. You're going to have uh, an eight inch stack on there, which I mean, they they draw like Steve, uh, our, the co-founder of this business, likes to say they draw like Walt Disney. So, you know, it's, uh, right. it's, uh, that's his. That's, I like it. Yeah. I like it. In the 
the shop and if he was about to weld something, he's like, don't look at it. So can it cause eye damage if you look at it? Or was he just like, don't sit too close to the TV or look at the No, uh, in this case, your dad was telling the truth. Uh, okay. Electrical welders produce an arc. It's a little tiny electric spark that jumps from the welder to the workpiece. It's what actually melts the steel and causes the material to weld. So it's electricity. It's electricity, yeah. It's, okay. a, little, it's a little lightning bolt about that long. So is, is it the same kind of thing where you run electricity through um, like like a, a cooktop where it has the wires? Is, is it like that? You run electricity and the um, resistance causes like the, the, the heat clicker? up? Uh, no. Okay. No, so in this case, what you have is an open circuit. So okay. there's uh, a machine that's plugged into the wall. There's a positive end of the circuit that comes out to a little gun that you're holding in your hand. There's the negative end of the circuit that comes out to a little ground clamp that hooks onto the piece itself. And so in between the end of the gun, which is a little piece of wire sticking out, and the workpiece clamp situation, which is the other half of the circuit, the electricity is going to actually jump through the air. And because air is very resistant to electricity passing through it, it creates a ton of friction, which creates a ton of heat. And that's actually what allows you to heat the metal up and both. I see. Um, but it also produces a ton of energy. In particular, uh, it gives off a lot of UV radiation. And that UV I radiation, see. if you look at it with the naked eye, it can cause damage. So that's why you got to wear your safety glasses, wear your welding helmet, and uh, worst case scenario, just look away, don't look at it. So I'll get you guys some safety glasses so, uh, okay. and, so you're not looking right at the arc. Okay. Safety cool. glasses have UV coatings on them, so they're all like, oh. they protect your eyes. Oh, great. All right, all geared up. Okay. All right. Let's weld some stuff. Cool. What's the thing on your back? Respirator. So it's powered. It actually like sucks air in from back here, HEPA filters it, and pushes it through the breathing tube. Yeah. Like air conditioning for your face. This is a very special welding helmet. They, there's only a few of these. Like this is a you have to like buy the with the helmet that has the adapter built into it. It's yeah, usually. Most are just yeah, most are just the helmet. This is usually for welding things like stainless steel, which gives off hexavalent chromium, which will make you real sick. Um, but there, I do enough grinding of paint that is of questionable origin here that I'd rather have a full respirator on. about this the how argon doesn't really conduct heat right or it does it just doesn't do it very well right so they throw a little co2 in there to make it hotter you can actually weld with 100 percent co2 if you need the extra heat oh air compressor So it's like, you know, I was saying how a welder creates a circuit and, you know, passes a tiny little bit of electricity in there to heat the metal up. Plasma cutter does the same thing, except instead of squirting more liquid metal into the joint, it shoots a jet of compressed air, swirling compressed air through the arc. And that compressed air gets so hot when it passes by that extreme heated electricity, the electrical arc, that it becomes plasma, which is like the fourth state of matter. 
Um, right? Science teacher, fourth day of yep. Yeah, so plasma is when something gets so hot that uh, its electrons start getting disassociated from yeah. the atom itself. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, and so it creates a little spinning blade of plasma uh, that can cut right through steel plate. Uh, goes right through the corner of your finger, too, no problem if you get your hand too close. I mean, like, real easy. <laughs> and no bleeding either. It's instantly cauterized. Oh, oh wow. my gosh. <laughs> You're going to cut that part out, right? <laughs> Here, no finger smokers. <laughs> so, Eric, I see a humongous propane tank, and I see big chunks of metal cut up here. Uh, I see you got a project going on, so why don't you tell us about what this is and the process by which you're going to be creating a brand new smoker for somebody who needs one. Sure. Well, this is actually a very unique smoker because this tank behind me here started its life as a 1,000 gallon propane mm -hmm. tank. That's an 18 foot long monster of a propane tank that would typically would be seen in something like a Franklin's barbecue or a mobile restaurant or something like that. Right. And uh, the client, in this case, didn't want a 500 gallon because that would have been too small. But he didn't want a 1,000 gallon because that would have been too big. So he said, well, how about a 750? And I said, well, they don't make 750s. <laughs> he said, I'd like one anyway. And so <laughs> here we are. What I've done is actually take and remove 42 inches of length, the equivalent of about 250 gallons of volume from the tank, and then re-welded the cap back onto the tank. So you can actually see um, where, you know, this tank would have been an extra 42 inches long. Now there's a weld line, the, the cap is back on, and there are three doors running down the length of the smoker. Then I took that 42 inch section that I had cut off and cut the top off of that. So what we're going to have is a big flat cooking surface on top of the firebox. One interesting fact about cooking with a live fire is that the top of that firebox, even though it's quarter inch plate, it gets really hot. I mean, I'm talking sear a steak, cook an egg hot. Uh, and so having the flat top on top of the firebox allows you to do things like, you know, carne asada or burgers or even uh, throwing your bean pot up there and cooking your beans right over your fire. Um, which is just a really fun thing to do while you're cooking um, right. all day on a smoker. So he's going to have a, about 16 square feet of flat top space, just like uh, you know, we're using every part of the animal here. I'm using every part of this 1,000-gallon tank to make a custom 750-gallon smoker. Wow, so the, the flat top, did I hear right, 16 square feet? Yeah, this is going to be about 4 by 4 um, okay. so he's going to have about 16 square feet of flat top. That's a huge cooking space that yeah. you get as a side benefit. Right? Absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's one of the features that we, as we were developing these designs, we realized that with a, a standard propane tank that's been cut in half to use as a firebox, specifically if you're going to do a reverse flow, it comes up a little too high on the cook chamber and it interferes with your ability to put your stack where you want it. Right. So we started cutting the tops off of them and we realized as soon as we did that that, hey, now we've got a nice flat hot surface that we can cook on. Um, right. Which is something that people with square fireboxes have always known. Um, you can cook your beans there, you can throw you know, meat or veggies on there and they cook up just like that. Um, but now you can do it with a, with a tank smoker as well. Right. And so for this 750, I know that you said that with a 500 gallon you can do reverse flow, with a 1000 it's too big, do standard flow. Is this going to be standard flow or reverse? This is going to be standard flow. Yeah, this, I feel like with 750 you're still big enough that you're not going to lose an appreciable amount of space inside the chamber right. because of the cook chamber opening. Right, and you still get a lot of draft, a lot of airflow through it oh, because yeah. of the standard flow, big stack. And so the thermodynamics work for a smoker this size. Absolutely. Okay. And so you want to talk to us about maybe like how you're designing these doors, what's what's going sure. on there, or some of the customizations that you do well, that so you've done in the past? One unique feature of this smoker is that it is entirely hand built. Um, normally in my smokers, if you go to my Instagram, you'll see a lot of them have neat little uh, CNC cut features. Um, that I use a CNC cutter to produce. So basically I draw the file on a computer and I have a robot uh, make a nice perfect cut. In this case, every cut you see, every weld, every bend is all being done by hand. Mm -hmm. So this flat top was cut by hand, uh, the door flange was cut by hand, and the handles and the hinges in this case, I wanted to kind of go back and, and do a, a traditional Texas style handle. And anyone who knows Texas style smokers will recognize this design. It's the bent bar handle that you see uh, on a lot of old fashioned smokers. Um, so I'm using half inch steel bar that I hand bent and fitted to the lids uh, and then quarter inch steel bar that I've uh, fitted and uh, cut into shape for the flanges. So this is going to be 100% built by hand. There'll be no automation in any part of the process. I see that maybe you did some planning right here on this cap. Is yep. that is that you? 
Yeah, these are, this is kind of a, uh, a unique feature of our smokers. It started almost by accident. Things like, you know, size calculations and, and cut lists and so forth. We just started jotting them down on the smokers. And uh, the first one that we ever built, I was getting ready to clean it off the lid. And uh, the guy who was going to take it home said, hey, no, no, leave it. I like it. Uh, and so now if you get one of these big guys, you'll have a list of, of calculations, drawings, and so forth on the smoker itself. It's uh, sort of part of the build process that gets uh, immortalized on the smoker. Right. I know that, like, if you get, say, a really expensive car, you, you might, on the engine, have a, a little plate that's built by Steve Brown yeah. or something like that. This is kind of like that same customization. Yeah. Oh, I know who built this, and oh, this is how it was done. Yeah. These are the calculations. This is what went into making my smoker, and it, it's kind of an endearing feature, I think rather than just kind of a leftover scrap that, oh, he just didn't clean that off. No, I think the, the first guy was absolutely right. For me, I would love to see this on here. So if somebody comes up and they look at your smoker, they see, well, what are these drawings about? And you can say, you know what, this, this smoker wasn't one that I bought you know, from some company that makes a thousand of these. No, this one was made for me. And this is what Eric put on here when he was making it. So I think it's, it's a nice touch. And I think that probably most all of your customers are going to want to leave it on there. Absolutely. And if you get sick of it, just get rubbing alcohol in a rag and you can take it right off. Right. No problem. Cool. So I know that you said that kind of the gold standard for wall thickness is a quarter of an inch. And I think these are a little bit bigger than that, right? Absolutely. One of the great things about building smokers out of these old propane tanks is that a lot of them are old enough to have been built at a time when steel was inexpensive enough and manufacturing standards were high enough that most of them are built out of thicker wall material. For example, this guy is built out of 3 8 of an inch thick steel. So that's an eighth mm -hmm. of an inch thicker than your average quarter inch wall smoker. Uh, I've seen them up to uh, just over half an inch thick. But even at 3 8 you're gonna get such good retention of heat inside the walls of the smoker that you're really gonna be able to just manage a temperature very closely with surprisingly little effort given that it's a smoker of this size. So this is where the... Firebox yep. is going to get attached. Firebox is going over here. So what was that end of the cooker is now going to be the far other yeah, end. Yeah, it's moving down to the other end. Yeah. Okay. And so how do you, the thing is, I was always curious, how do you do the attachments? How do you figure out like, like what kind of an arc to cut out to attach the firebox? Because it's not like a flat surface to a flat surface. Right. Well, I mean, there's geometry involved here, and you, to, a, to a certain extent, you can use mathematical formulas and, and model things on a computer. What right. I have found, though, especially because these salvage tanks can be sometimes just a touch out of round, or maybe they've you know, got one end a little bit longer than the other. I mean, who knows if this thing was manufactured 100 years ago, what's going on with these things. Right. A lot of this comes down to the fabrication by feel technique. And basically, you can have a good plan, but you got to be ready to adjust that plan based on what you see in front of you. So a lot of this is going to be cut it, fit it, grind it, cut it some more, fit it some more, grind it some more, just kind of work your way through it as you go. Um, everything is, it's, it's not the fastest way to build this, but um, you, can, you can pretty much get a perfect fit if you're just patient and uh, methodical about how you go through it. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And um, I think doing it that way, you ensure that the quality is always high. Right. right? It can't just be kind of loose fitting or uh, have imperfect seals or something like that because I mean, if you're taking the time, you're, you're looking at it, you're making slight adjustments so that it's perfect, you know that the quality isn't going to deteriorate because of mass production or, or just cookie cutter approaches to building smokers. Absolutely. And the truth is that the vast majority of the work in building a smoker or building anything that involves metal fabrication is not the welding itself. People think of these and they think, well, I got to know how to weld. Well, you certainly do have to know how to weld. However, Knowing how to properly cut, knowing how to properly fit, understanding the way metal is going to move when it heats up and cools down. Um, these are sort of the, the devil that, that, that lives in the details when it comes to building smokers. You really spend a lot of your time on preparation um, and making sure the surfaces are ready for the final weld in and ready to be um, you know, set in place before you actually ever pick up a welder and finish the, finish the product. These are obviously older propane tanks. So what happens? Do they, do they get to a point where they start losing pressure or something, and then they just retire the tanks, and they go sit somewhere, and then you go buy them, or how does that work? Yeah, so these are all salvage propane tanks, okay. and when it comes to propane tanks, 
they can be they can be deemed salvaged for a number of reasons. Any steel tank that holds pressurized gas from a big giant propane tank like that to even a little uh, compressed gas bottle that holds uh, shielding gas for a welder, they have to be tested every five years hydrostatically and they have to be visually inspected every so often as well. And a tank can fail either of those types of tests for a number of different reasons. Uh, you know, once rust starts accumulating on the surface, if a valve gets deformed somehow, it bangs into something, um, they'll just be designated as salvage and no longer be legally allowed to be filled with propane. So at that point, they start their life as a salvage tank. And you can find salvage tanks all over the place. Um, they're kind of tough to locate, but there's usually a few places around like, wherever you live that'll, that'll have them. You just want to make sure you find a tank that's been salvaged for a number of months or years. Uh, because propane at atmospheric temperature and pressure evaporates, it's a gas, so it'll just float out of the tank and be gone. Um, but you want to make sure the tank has been sitting for a good long time without any valves on it, so there's no chance that there's gas inside. Even still, you want to be very careful if you're going to try to uh, attempt to cut one of these open. I would actually not recommend your viewers to try to right. do that because it, is, it, it can be very dangerous. But yeah, these, these are all, they, they get salvaged for a number of different reasons. Do you know when this tank was built? So, if you look on the front end, on the front side of this, uh -huh. they all have build plates. I grind them off usually. Was it in part? Oh, it might have been on the part that I cut that I cut. Anyway, the build plate on this one was so old that it had actually rusted down, and you couldn't read the lettering anymore. So, so old, very old. I don't know exactly how old it was. I do know that like the one for Joe that I just built, that tank was manufactured in 1953, and I could still read the letters. So. Gives you know, I mean, things don't rust that fast here in SoCal, so. Right. Yeah, it's, uh, they're all, they're all different. Yeah, I wonder if, uh, the people who were making this thought, you know, someday somebody's going to build a fire at the end of this thing. Probably not. Probably, Probably not. Probably not, yeah. And I think, I think a lot of the traditional style smokers, I could be wrong, but if, if I remember correctly, they came from pipes that were used in like, oh, oil drilling, yeah. right? Yeah, you had, you had these guys in like the mid 20th century, like even earlier, you had all these like welders who were just out in the oil fields and they were, they had all this extra pipe laying around and, you know, just, I mean, some person figured out that you could just cap the ends of it and there you go, you got a, you got a great place to build a fire and cook barbecue. Wow. Now, I know that there's an event coming up here in LA on October 7th, you wanna tell us about that? Absolutely. So we are going to be at McLeod Ale. It's a brewery in Van Nuys, California. October 7th, starting at 4 p.m. Uh, we're going to do probably about five or 600 pounds of meat. We're going to have brisket, the spare ribs, whole hog, and sides. We're partnering with a few local barbecue companies in the area, including Trudy's Underground Barbecue, Moose Craft Barbecue, and Ragtop Fern Barbecue. And we're all going to be serving that barbecue from 4 p.m. until it sells out. And it's at a brewery, so there's beer and I believe it's an Oktoberfest theme, so there'll be live music. So if you uh, if you want to come actually see a fat sack smoker, this unit behind me here, the 750 gallon smoker, will be there, uh, and we'll be serving barbecue right off of it. So you can come meet everybody and try the barbecue for yourself, and uh, we look forward to seeing you guys there. It's going to be a great time. I can guarantee it. You're going to have great barbecue, great brew, and a lot of good times with the people who are also barbecue enthusiasts. Now you have an Instagram. That's how I actually found you, and I love. Eric's Instagram. Every time you post something, I always think to myself, this is so cool. It, whether it's pictures of meat that has come off of a smoker or building a smoker itself, it's always interesting to me and you need to follow him. What's your Instagram handle? The Instagram handle is at FatStackSmokers, so you can come follow and check out the material. And I also have my contact information right on the, right on the page there. So. Right on the page. So you, if you want to contact Eric, you can go to his Instagram and find his contact information there and uh, give him a call and see what he can do for you. And I'll put the link for that Instagram handle in the description as well. Thank you for watching Mad Scientist Barbecue. If you're interested in purchasing your own fat stack smoker, which you should be, if you're serious about barbecue and you live in Southern California, be sure to give Eric a call. I have a coupon code in the description and I'll also include Eric's information. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe below. Also, my Instagram and Twitter are going to be in the description. See you next time. I don't know any serious barbecue person who says it's about the season, but yeah, that. it's the it's the paprika. <laughs> okay. You know they they shot entire movies in a single take before. They have. Yeah, pretty crazy. And so the aluminum foil, I think, is not necessarily a bad idea. Say that again. The aluminum foil. Okay. Nice having a bunch of mechanic shops. Yeah. Right <laughs> That's the character.
Do you know where we were in the rambling answer that I was giving? That is equity. Yep. Wow. Oh, so you. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> it's so echoey in there. <laughs> Thanks so much. No problem. It was a pleasure.